Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to uh, round one coverage of my games from the 2017 Western Class Championship, which was uh, played last weekend down in Southern California. This was a, a large um, tournament and uh, pretty well run. It was um, had over 200 players in it and uh, was nicely divided, evenly divided into class sections. So all according to the normal, all according to the normal boundaries. No funny uh, cutoffs like 1700 or 1900. Um, so I played in the Class A section in this tournament, even though my rating was uh, 1795. I figured that was uh, close enough to allow me to still play in Class A. Um, you know, it's always uh, a choice. You have the option of uh, playing up in these tournaments, and sometimes you'll see uh, younger players doing that a lot as they're trying to improve, just playing up in the higher section. But in general, I prefer to play in the in the appropriate section for my rating. But at 1795, I felt like I was close enough, and I played up in Class A. And uh, let's see, my opponent in round one was an adult with a rating of uh, 1862, and uh, I had the white pieces. So let's see how it goes. I kicked off with e4. He went c5. I go knight f3, and he goes uh, e6. So one of the e6 Sicilians. This is a pretty flexible move and uh, can uh, lead to a number of different systems. Um, the two most popular moves here are d6 or knight to uh, knight to uh, c6. So it's a third in popularity, but it's a way I've played myself. I usually go for the con Sicilian, the other popular uh, follow-on from this move is the uh, Taimanov Sicilian, but my opponent actually has a different idea. So, but anyway, it's White's turn here, and I go for the open Sicilian. That's the way I like to play. And um, then he plays knight to f6. That's a, a pretty logical follow-on, and he's just hitting this pawn and uh, encouraging me to bring my knight out, blocking my c-pawn so I can't, uh, I can't play c5 immediately and to get a Meroxy bind. And then he goes d6, and this completes his setup. At this point, um, he could still go for a Taimanov with knight c6 or a Khan Sicilian with uh, a6. Although normally the a6 move, if you're playing the Khan, you play that even before you play knight, knight to f6. Um, so, uh, but but both those are playable moves at this point. Um, but he went with d6, and this is the uh, Skaveningen. <laughs> I won't I won't pronounce it like that, uh, but I'll call it the Skaveningen. Um, let's see. Um, so the the interesting thing about this is that um, it subjects uh, Black to the Kara's attack, which is what I played with, with uh, g4. The the pawn on d6 has blocked in this bishop, so um, so Black doesn't have the same control that he has over the uh, g4 square um, that he has in other lines of the Sicilian. So that allows white to play g4 immediately. It's not even a pawn sack. You're holding onto the pawn with the queen. And uh, it's a pretty dangerous attack. Uh, it's not the only move here. You can play a move, for example, you can play bishop e3 and go for an English attack set up with queen to d2 and castling kingside. That's also fine for white. And notice you don't have to play um, f3 immediately because uh, you control the um, you control the g4 square at the moment, so knight g4 to harass the bishop is not happening. Although you probably want to play f3 before you play queen d2 and give up control of that square. But it's a little nuance. You can play bishop e3 immediately here. Um, another way to play this is to go with bishop to e2, and uh, with kingside castling. This is a more uh, positional setup and uh, also a fine way for white to play. So a couple of options for you if you don't want to play the Kara's attack. But in fact, the, the most popular move in this position is the Kara's attack with g4. And um, and I played it. <laughs> you know, it's not, this may be the first time I've had the chance to play the Kara's attack. I've, I've seen it before, but I don't remember if I ever had a chance to play it in a real game, just because the, the Skavening and setup is uh, opening is not, the Skavening and setup actually is still popular, although usually uh, he, people get to it by uh, knight or move order, and uh, and somehow this makes this move less attractive. Um, anyway, um, but the the Skaveningen in opening, which is these these moves exactly in this order, uh, is not played very much at the top level because of the g4 attack, and uh, g4 is the main move here, the Kara's attack. Okay, so he plays h6. That's the main response. Slow down that pawn, and then h4. 
And now black goes for a6. a6 is not the main move here. Actually, the main way it goes is knight to c6, followed by rook to g1. And I wanted to show this rook g1 idea because I actually forgot this in the game. So if you're ever um, if you're ever facing the Skaveningen, um, that's that's your idea. Push those pawns forward and uh, move the rook to g1. It, it has two ideas behind it. One is, of course, just to push that pawn forward. But the second idea is that um, you know, there's this potential pin along the h-file, um, so if you push forward and black takes, you can't take back because your, your rook on h1 is uh, loose. So get your rook off of h1 so black doesn't have a pin on the h-file, and at the same time um, threaten to uh, push the g-pawn forward. And notice that, um, you know, you're not, you're not planning to castle <laughs> king sight anyway after having played uh, g5 on uh, g4 on move 6. So, uh, so, but you're, this is, uh, you still have the ability to castle queenside after a couple of moves. So you're actually not, you're getting an attack without taking a lot of risk. That's why this is, I think, uh, uh, a good way for white to play. Uh, let's see, he didn't play with knight c6, he played with a6. And uh, I could have played with that rook g1 idea here, but like I said, I had forgotten about it. And I just uh, went on with g5 immediately. And a third way to play is to play uh, bishop g2 first. And this is also leads to a good position for white. Um, all these moves are okay, by the way. All these moves are good for white, even the move that I played. Um, but um, bishop g2 or rook to g1 are a little more popular. My, my move is kind of obscure. Let's see. And so to show how this might go, bishop g2, knight c6, then g5. And when he takes take with the pawn, allowing this exchange, but the bishop is defending the rook, and uh, this looks like a good position for white. Uh, the knight's going to have to move. You've gained a lot of space here. Um, there's no big threats that are going to prevent you from just playing bishop to e3, queen d2, and castling, so uh, you know white's going to look pretty secure here after a while, and, and black's position is going to look a little shaky, and uh, there's no kingside castling here for uh, black either. Um, so that's probably the best way to play. But uh, like I said, I, I looked at this with the chess engine, and it is a line in the opening book, but it's, it's a bit of an obscure line in the opening book, and, uh, but it does keep some advantage for black. But the point is now I have to take back with the bishop because he does have this pin operating on the h-file. And um, let's see, the, main, the line continues in the opening book. It continues queen b6, hitting the uh, b-pawn, knight b3, dropping back to uh, shield that pawn, queen to c7, a little bit of maneuvering, but uh, uh, queen to e2, maybe threatening to push this pawn forward or preparing to play f4, e5. Also, getting out of the way of the castled king. Looks like the bishop is going to come to g2 and, and uh, castling is going to happen. Anyway, he didn't play queen b6, and uh, you know I probably I didn't know that line anyway. I was improvising at this point. Um, so bishop to e7. And now I hit on this bishop g2 idea, I realized. Um, this uh, this bishop up here on g5 is actually loose. It's not really defended by the pawn because of the pin. But if I uh, if I just play bishop to um, g2 here, I've defended the rook. Now this bishop is defended, and I thought maybe I'd get some threats going along this diagonal with a potential uh, e5 move. Um, it turns out that uh, Black does not really need to worry too much about that e5 push. He can play knight c6 anyway. That, that kind of shields this diagonal. And I can't play e5 right away because he can just take it as long as this, uh, as long as the b pawn is protected here. So uh, that would have been an okay way to play. But he played uh, kind of directly against this e5 idea. He played e5 himself, and that just shuts me down. It prevents me uh, from getting any sort of tactic along this diagonal. So it's not a bad move. But uh, well, like I say, uh, White has still got a good position here. But I make a mistake in the next move. So uh, so. What's the uh, best move for white in this position? What would you play here? Okay, uh, pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to show what I played and show what the best moves are. The move I played is knight b3. Just dropping back here and, uh, well, there's no, not going to be problems with queen b6 now and my, you know, queen side will be pretty safe after I castle. So it's not uh, a bad move, but it's not the best move and it's not really in the spirit of the Keras attack. So we back up here. Actually, the best move, and uh, one I really didn't think very much about, 
this kind of move it's hard for me to play uh, knight to f5 and uh, well w one reason it's difficult for me to think of this move is because he trades a undeveloped piece for one of my developed pieces so I've sort of helped blacks development number one and number two uh, he has two pawns in the center and I have none <laughs> and uh, so you know it, it makes it uh, it seems seems kind of anti-positional as well as uh, anti yeah you know I'm, I'm hurting myself in the center and I'm hurting myself in development but uh, it, it's a good move um, you know black still needs to develop here and I've got control of the uh, d5 square he's he's can't really do anything about it my my bishop and my knight are coordinating actually on both of those squares so this is the kind of play where you're you're playing with the uh, peace pressure against the center and in the meantime you're still going to bust up uh, bust up uh, black's king side and um, and so you don't really need to be afraid of these uh, of these center pawns they're not going anywhere you've got them held with uh, peace pressure but anyway that's that's uh, that's the best move um, another move here that the chess engine likes better than knight to b3 is knight d to e2 um, and after queen b6 actually playing uh, bishop back to e3 chasing the queen there's kind of a cute line here uh, can you see why the queen is not able to take on b2 okay if you want time to think about that uh, pause the video I'm going to give the answer away if the queen takes on b2 it actually gets trapped it's a few moves deep, but uh, queen goes there. It's the only move. Rook to b3, chasing the queen. The queen goes here. It's the only move. And then bishop to b6. So the, uh, the rook, the knight, and the bishop there coordinate to trap the queen. Kind of cool. So anyway, that, that's why knight de2 is playable and queen b6 he is nothing to be afraid of. The queen just drops back after, after that. And uh, that's an okay position for white as well. Now, the way I played it, let's go back to the game with uh, knight to b3 um, is still okay for white uh, it's not like I've given uh, an advantage to black but it's not not the strongest move for black and not the strongest move for white okay so now he gets to develop he goes knight c6 I go queen d2 preparing to castle he goes b5 and um, at this point I make the first real mistake I think knight b3 is was okay but this next move is a definite mistake. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll try and explain my reasoning here, see if you can figure out the flaw in it. Um, it's often an idea in the uh, Sveshnikov to take this uh, knight with the bishop and then play um, knight to um, d5. And it's, um, you know, it's just uh, giving a good square for that knight and you're getting rid of this piece that can trade it off. And so that's what I was thinking. You know, this is looks like a kind of a Sveshnikov position where he's uh, he, he's pushed the e pawn ahead, and uh, and he's left behind this hole at d5. And uh, I was thinking it would be better than the Sveshnikov because with this pawn on um, h4, I'm actually controlling the g5 square. A lot of times, after uh, after bishop takes, bishop takes, knight to d5, uh, the bishop would come out to uh, to this square, and uh, and now that's not possible with this pawn here. So can you see the flaw in my thinking? <laughs> you can uh, pause the video here if you want some time to think about it. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, I took, he took, and um, and then I realized <laughs> the flaw in my thinking. This pawn here is hanging, right? He's got queen, bishop, and uh, rook uh, piled up on that. So if I go knight d5 here, he's just going to take that pawn for nothing so I pushed it on ahead um, actually that's not the best move here there was another better way to uh, not to defend the pawn but to get um, a decent position here and that would be to castle queenside this is a move I really I, I considered and I thought it would just be horrible because of course you don't want to place your queen and your king on this diagonal when he can take here and come back to this uh, to this great square supported by the queen the bishop on g5 supported by the queen is going to skewer the queen and king but of course this is a case where you can't go by visual impression you have to do it kind of move by move and uh, this is where you need to calculate rather than just uh, sort of thinking in general terms I guess and the, the move by move calculation will show you that he can't go to that square immediately he's got to take first to free up 
the uh, g5 square for bishop g5, and that gives you time to take here. So you're really just trading the h-pawn uh, for the d-pawn, and this would still be good. So if we go back to this point, I, I made uh, kind of two mistakes in a row here. Uh, the first one was just this whole idea of the trade, thinking that he couldn't go to g5 and not noticing not noticing that um, that the pawn was hanging. And then the second mistake was pushing the pawn forward instead of uh, just castling. And But now, because I haven't castled, his bishop comes to g5, and it becomes very difficult for me to castle. So black has a good game at this point. So those two imprecise moves, even though material is still even here, have given black a good game. Let's see. Plays with b4. I get my knight to d5. Well, at least I get my knight to a good post. And I also had ideas of... Uh, bringing my knight back here so I get castle queenside. He plays bishop e6 to harass my knight, and I drop back my knight to e3. Actually, the chess engine likes to move um, bishop to h3 here, and uh, just allowing that trade. But, you know, it, that uh, would make it a little awkward for uh, for black to castle on the queenside as well. But, mm, I don't know. Anyway, I think knight to e3 is okay. And um, let's see, he took on b3, took that knight, I took back. I thought this maybe was helping me, but I'll, on the other hand, it kind of weakens my queen side, so it's not, not looking particularly attractive to castle on either side of the board at this point. Whereas uh, yeah, black at some point might be able to castle. He's still got two pawns over there holding his king position. Let's see. Um, so he played knight to d4 now, harassing my queen. I went queen to d3. And now he played bishop e3, and I think this is actually a mistake on black's part. Um, the chess engine likes the move rook to c8, and this is uh, really the move I was afraid of, rook to c8, coordinating with his rook and his uh, knight on this square. And then he can chop this guy off at any time and, um, and then win this pawn. I can't castle because uh, rook takes would force me to trade. Uh, after, after getting rid of the knight, he could take there with the rook and that would force me to trade the queen and a pawn for a rook and knight which would be a, a good trade for black so I'd probably have to uh, defend defend that pawn with the rook and then um, <clears throat> you know that's pretty ugly uh, this knight is pinned and things are just not looking good so rook c8 I think is a strong move the chess engine says I don't know if I would have found this knight to c4 is the best way to defend and then rook to c6 continuing like this maybe castling and you know just bringing all the pieces over to the queen side here. Um, and I, I still can't castle after this. <laughs> so that would have been best play for black. Um, this actually uh, uh, is uh, gives me some hope here. I think, um, you know, now both sides have chances. I mean, it looks ugly that I've got these doubled pawns, but they're chasing the knight away from this square, so he's not going to be causing any more mischief over here. He drops back to e6. And these pawns, these two pawns are holding back his two pawns. So uh, I think this is okay. The only thing I have to worry about in this position is I uh, have to activate my bishop at some point. Um, so what should I play here? Uh, I did think of just castling. I mean, I've been thinking about uh, castling for a while now. And, uh, and uh, you know, the whole point of that knight to e3 move was to block the bishop so I could castle a queenside. And castling queenside is... Um, is the best move here according to the chess engine. But uh, as I was looking at this position, I also noticed that uh, while well, these exchanges opened up the A file, the exchange on B3, and uh, yeah, I can grab that pawn. <laughs> of course, if I grab that pawn, then I'm never castling. But uh, well, after I take the pawn, it looks like there will be some trades because I'm also attacking, the rook here was also would be attacking on um, D6. So that would force some trades and get us closer to an endgame. And going into an endgame, a pawn up uh, with a bishop versus a knight, I mean, it seemed like uh, a decent idea to me at the time. Uh, with the help of the chess engine, uh, basically, uh, black has, because of my awkward king position over here, black has enough compensation. So it's better for me not to take that pawn and just castle and uh, play in the center here and, and try and activate my bishop. So play a little more slowly. But anyway, during the game, I decided to take. Um, and the chess engine rates this as about even. I mean, not that. It liked Castle and Queenside slightly better, but thought this was okay too. 
uh, but it's just harder to play. <laughs> I think that's that's what it comes down to. And uh, well, keep in mind, I have to make 40 moves in an hour and 40. And here we're up on move 22, and it's already been a complicated game. And uh, Black just castles here. Like I was saying, uh, he's still got these two pawns uh, in front of the uh, king over here on the king side. Um, if I push this forward, he can always push the g-pawn forward. Um, looks like I'm not getting a lot of uh, mileage out of that. I mean, it creates some dark squared weaknesses, but I have a light squared bishop, so so it's not really uh, not really something I can exploit a whole lot. Um, anyway, so I bring my queen back over here to the um, to the king side or to the center. I was actually worried about his queen coming out immediately. And it can make some pretty big threats. It can hit the bishop, it can hit the pawn here, and it can add to the pressure to this pawn, although that's not, not under attack as long as it's defended. But that could be kind of awkward. So bringing the queen back, this is a good move, I think. Played queen g5, and, um, and now I make a little mistake here. Bishop h3. Um, you know, I'm holding on to things and I'm trying to activate the bishop. I had the idea of getting to this square, but it opens up things for, uh, opens up certain possibilities for uh, black. Let's see, a better try might be queen to f3 first. Say after queen to f3, he could try, uh, I was a little worried he could try something like this, knight to c5, uh, ganging up on my pawns here, but it looks like I'm holding it all together, and then maybe rook f1. Um, this is the line suggested by the chess engine. Um, what bishop h3 does is it allows, uh, allows black to activate his rook. <laughs> the, uh, the bishop has, was defending the, the rook over here, and now he plays rook a8. And because I played this move, bishop h3, um, you know, he's immediately threatening to come down here and just win a piece. So, um, so I need to get my uh, king off the back rank. And, um, and the best move here is actually king d2. Um, holding on to things. I didn't like this because uh, it, uh, you know, it's walking into a pin. At some point you might be able to play knight to c5, but the immediate knight c5 uh, doesn't really lead to anything. Uh, the queen comes over here to... Oh, I'm sorry. That's knight c5 is, is a move, then, and then queen g2 is the way to deal with it. Um, the, the move I was worried about was knight to d4, hitting the queen and taking advantage of this pin, um, but queen to g4 deals with that. So again, it's about calculating uh, the specifics. Let's see, he can, he can drop back along this diagonal. He has to maintain the pin, and then queen g2 coming back and defending seems to hold on to everything. So king to d2 is um, okay. Uh, king to f2 runs into difficulty. And, uh, and at this point, black starts to get a definite edge. And can you find the, uh, the move that I overlooked? Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. Pause the video if you want time to think about it. Yeah, the move I missed here was queen h4 check. And that's just a, a fork here. Um, hitting the uh, king and hitting the pawn. Uh, let's see. I think there's something wrong with king to f3. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm looking at this now, and I, I don't know why I didn't try this. King f3. Uh, I, I remember why. Yeah, because of the knight coming in here with check, and uh, that's that's mate. Well, it, no, it's not mate. I'm sorry, but that's that's pretty nasty, and he gets the pawn anyway. That's why. Uh, it took me a while to remember that. Okay, so king g2 is what I played, and he just gets the pawn. So the material is even. King over here. But uh, black has the better position, and uh, he's uh, got some winning ideas here. Once again, uh, rook to c8 is, uh, would probably lead to a pretty quick win for black or rook to a2. But he didn't play the best move here. He played a tricky move. He played knight to f4, taking advantage of the pin here. But, uh, well, this gives me some, uh, some counter chances. So can you find the, uh, the best uh, move for white in this position? pretty interesting complicated position so uh, pause the video if you want some time to think about it okay I'm giving the answer away now yeah I think there's only one move that uh, defends here but it, it does seem to work and that is bishop to g2 
<laughs> so yeah, he had a weakness too. He's got this uh, this uh, diagonal where he's placed both his queen and his rook. So that's a skewer. And uh, well, if he takes my queen, I take his queen, and I'm hitting his rook. Um, and you know, his knight without the queen is not so dangerous over here. And it seems to be, you know, about an even position. He goes for um, for complete annihilation. He takes takes the bishop took back he takes the queen and uh, really he doesn't have anything better at that point he could go for some checks but it just leads to a kind of perpetual or a trade and then I take back and then he goes rook to a2 and um, I play rook b1 defending the pawn so you know it seems like kind of a ugly position but it's a rook and pawn endgame with even material and I really should be able to uh, hold this so let's continue this is a long video so let's go forward some moves and just see how things evolve. I think it's pretty natural. He brings his king up to attack the pawn. And I bring my king in to defend it. He trades off. I was a little bit surprised that he didn't um, take with a pawn and try to get a passer out here, but it turns out um, he's going to try and get a pass pawn in the center with these three pawns, and that's an equally good plan. So I've, I play e4 to stop him from advancing his pawns right away, and I played c4 get that pawn going so I can try and get some threats with my pawns plays here and now um, the next move is actually um, a mistake that gets me into trouble uh, right here uh, what was I, I was worried about well I was still trying to stop him from playing this move um, f5 and so I wanted to keep my king in this neighborhood um, but it turns out there's no good way to do it. Also, I want to point out I'm, I'm on move 36 here. So we're marching down to the time control. We've got four moves to make the time control. And both of us have been using our time up. Uh, you know, so I still have a couple minutes per move. But you know, I've been using my time at an even pace. But I don't have uh, an unlimited amount of time like you have in the beginning of the game to think about this. But um, the move I made was king to g5 trying to keep an eye on this square, and that's a blunder. So let's back up. What I should have played was king f3, and then um, in this line, you know, black can do some maneuvering with his rook, but um, this is a chess engine line. It seems to not lead to a whole lot, and uh, should be um, a draw would be the, the result of that line. Um, so I played king g5 here instead, and um, can you find the uh, move for black here? Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. Um, and I have to give my opponent credit for finding. This is the one time where where this is he has his chance to uh, relieve the pressure on these pawns, and at the same time make a threat. And uh, the threat is to come here and check my king away. And my king is caught in an awkward spot. That check would not allow me. I can't go to any of these squares. Right, they're covered by uh, Black's king and his his pawn. So the check here would drive my king to this side and then my king would be cut off so that would be um, really bad for me so that means after rook a8 I have to move my king back and so that gave him a tempo he gets rook g8 and once again I don't want to go to the h file and be cut off so my king goes back and uh, and then he gets uh, rook h8 in so if we compare that to the other line where I went uh, king f3 immediately and then he goes rook a8 Basically, I have time to bring my rook over, and you know, there's only two files, and uh, you know, with my rook controlling one file and my king uh, controlling key entry squares in the other file, it prevents him from activating his rook, and that's the key idea in this endgame: activating that rook. And uh, after king g5, he can do it with tempo with rook a8, and yeah, I played king g4, so it's pretty much forced. Rook g8, king back, and now rook h8. Is what I play here. <clears throat> oh no, it's his turn. He plays rook h8, and um, yeah, that's the point. It's one tempo. If I had have gotten, if I could have gotten my rook there, we would have gotten that other situation. So yeah, I've fallen behind by one tempo. Now he's got this uh, big threat of coming in here with the skewer and picking up a pawn. That's the importance of the active rook. So I play king g3, and uh, he played rook g8 check. And we this is move 40, so he made the time control. He could have actually played f5 already, but he wanted a little time to think about it. Let's see, he checks, he drives me back here, and then he plays um, f5. 
So after the time control, he's had time to think about it. And uh, this is just a, a winning plan for, uh, for Black. I have no way to stop his pawns. And this is a good example of, uh, you know, having a better quality of pawns in the end game. Also, the more active rook. I, you know, it turns out I can activate my rook, but uh, you know, he's got one pawn against three over here. But uh, between this pawn and this pawn, he's holding back all three of my pawns. So he's effectively got a passed pawn in this end game or an extra pawn. And, uh, and that's enough to, uh, to get the win. So let's just go forward. Um, like I said, this is a long video. Um, and there's different things I could try, like King F2, but uh, none of them work. He, he got, just to show you the King F2 line, I drop back and the rook comes over. And uh, King E5. And this also leads to uh, a win, although maybe it's a, a more stubborn defense. But uh, anyway, he gets this check. And he finally gets the skewer and picks up a pawn. And uh, I went for a, a one pawn against two pawns endgame. And it just turns out this is a losing endgame. Sometimes you can draw these, but uh, oh, these pawns are close enough together. And he does a good job of uh, generating threats against my king and, uh, and pushing that pawn forward. And uh, so I tried various things, but at this point... He finally manages to uh, get his king to a good position and uh, get my king cut off. And, uh, and this is just a win. If I check again here, he's going to uh, block. So anyway, my first round game, I thought that was a very interesting game. Uh, and I had some, uh, some play, particularly in the beginning. And in fact, all the way up to uh, move 37, I had uh, at least a draw or good, good drawing chances. And it was just this king g5 move. Uh, played near the time control that actually uh, got me into trouble. So anyway, I hope you guys uh, found this interesting, and I will be uh, back soon with, uh, with uh, future rounds. See you then. Bye.